In the lowlands of West Sussex, just south of Horsham, Gatwick's metal birds stack up in the sky. But right below lies a land of wildlife and wild places. Here, arrivals and departures rival destinations of any human traveller. Something exciting has been growing at a pace that nature prefers. This is Nep Wildland. With the Dick for Victory anthem still ringing out from the days of war, Nep Castle Estate, like so many others, redoubled efforts and created intensive fields of crops. Agricultural subsidies supported post-war efforts, but nature clung to the disappearing hedgerows. Britain's biodiversity across the country increased its freefall. At Nep Castle Estate, 320 metres of Wildon clay on a cap of limestone finally marginalised this farming enterprise and brought it to its financial knees. But at its low point, at the dawn of the new millennium, a pioneering project was born. Influenced by Dutch ecologist Franz Vera and others, Nep Castle Estate at 7 kilometres from top to toe and covering some 1,400 hectares changed gear and began again. From wall to wall crops there is now wall to wall wildlife. Wilding had begun. Now, Nep is a breeding hotspot for endangered nightingales and turtle doves, while over 50 other bird species have been recorded here. Spring at Nep is just an amazing surround sound experience of beautiful bird song. Stoats, weasels, and polecats shimmy through the shabby tussocks in scrubby meadows. and harvest mice plus hedgehogs are a welcome addition. All five species of British owl now call Nep home, whilst 13 out of the UK's species of breeding bats have taken advantage of pesticide-free food and billowing hedgerows to commute and forage. Dragonflies and damselflies busy themselves on marginal watery vegetation. And with butterflies rising in number and variety, they point to the goodness in this landscape. Hidden below, 18 earthworm species suggest soil health is improving too. How did this happen? In 2001, work began but eco-targets were not part of the plan. Instead, mega herbivores wander the Serengeti-style landscape, and wildlife like the turtle dove and purple emperor butterfly are teaching eco-lessons as to where they really want to live, rather than where they are forced to cling on. Visitors now find long-horned cattle grazing and browsing as proxies for extinct aurochs. And Tamworth pigs rootling in place of wild boar.
Exmoor ponies live freely where tarpans might once have reigned. And deer graze in ways that stimulate different types of vegetation too. Amongst them, thorny scrub protects oak saplings, as it always used to, and vegetation succession runs a bruising battle with herbivory. as it always would have done before humans tamed the land. NEP's resident ecologist Penny Green gave me a summary of this fascinating wilding project. Why does rewilding at NEP matter? Rewilding here at NEP over the last 20 years or so has just been uh, really amazing big experiment and it matters because we can show that you can change a previously intensively farmed landscape into something really wonderful for nature and we can show that uh, funding streams can support that that you can produce uh, uh, pasture fed free roaming organic meat from the project and you can provide an amazing green space for people as well at the same time um, but also uh, you're providing loads of different ecosystem services so is you know we've got nectar sources that we can see behind us for pollinators, uh, we've got um, a river restoration so that helps alleviate uh, flood events uh, and so on. You know, we're helping the soil health uh, you know, come, come back to life again. And so th there's so many different things going on here that help us understand more about recovering landscapes and also landscapes um, that are linking up on a larger scale that help uh, join our nature reserves up as well. So rewilding is so many different things to different people and I think it's a very exciting time. We're part of this big wave of, of rewilding across the UK and so many people are joining in and jumping on and you know doing something wonderful for, for our biodiversity and for people as well. Restoration work to return the meanders and floodplains to the River Ada that bisects the estate are proving to be a rocket fuel for biodiversity too. However, Science needs evidence and lots of it, as do politicians, if policies and legislation are to support rewilding projects like that at NEP. Definitions of rewilding are plentiful too, unsurprising given that it can occur in different landscapes, cultures and under different degrees of human forcing. But at its simplest, it is no more than allowing nature time and space to develop in its own pathway. In 2017, a rewilding task force commissioned by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature added its own definition guided by 10 supporting principles. A key factor monitoring. Monitoring is a labour-intensive and expensive long-term commitment. At NEP, data is gained not only from surveyors but also from students carrying out their dissertations. Some rewilders might ask, if nature is really in the driving seat, why monitor it all? Expert ecologist Graham Lyons paused to survey work at NEP to unravel this paradox. So why do you think monitoring is important in rewilding? Well, monitoring is important wherever and whatever kind of site you're managing, whether it's a nature reserve um, which is a bit more prescriptively man managed, or a nature reserve, which is a bit more, or a rewilding project, which is a bit more open-ended. Um, and it's it's important because it guides um, what's working and what isn't. It's a, it's an early warning system to tell you whether or not um, what you're doing is it's going in the right direction. Um, so that's really great for the success stories. 
Um, but if it's also going in the wrong direction, that's a really important way of telling you that things aren't necessarily working. So things like uh, indicators such as um, uh, invertebrate biodiversity, um, uh, just the height of the sward and the, the amount of flowers that are there are all really important in rewilding because it tells you whether or not your grazing is pitched at the right level. And it's about, some people will say that the feedback between monitoring and management isn't necessarily as important in rewilding, but I disagree with that. I think it's vitally important. Um, and it's, it's there to tell us, yeah, whether or not we've got, we've got these grazing levels right, really. So can you give some personal highlights for the survey work you've been doing on this project? Sure, well, there's certainly, um, there's certainly lots of them. I've got lots of different projects happening on and around NEP. Um, in the very short term, about five minutes ago, recorded a, a wild service seedling in, this, um, in these vegetation structure plots. And that's really nice to see that regenerating out in the open grassland. Um, only at the weekend was I uh, assessing the invertebrates on the river restoration in the, in the uh, rewilding area itself. And we found some really stonkingly good invertebrates there that weren't there five years ago, including a beetle, a uh, carabid, a ground beetle new to West Sussex, Dichromus germanus, nationally rare vulnerable species. We've got this beautiful, um, um, uh, the, the longhorn general, which is a type of soldier fly, it's a bee mimic, and it has aquatic larvae and uh, Stratiomyus longicornis. That's fantastic, and and just dragonflies everywhere, and and, and that's really good. Um, and then last year I did a lot of survey work here, particularly focused on looking at the deadwood invertebrates, um, and we made uh, we put we put NEP on the map as I think about the eleventh best site in in Britain for deadwood saprozylic beetles so there's certainly a lot a lot to be found um, and every day you see something new so yeah plenty to be seen close by in purple emperor butterfly heaven was national expert matthew oates his work highlights that nature can teach us a few things thought of as a resident of ancient woodland he has demonstrated that this power-packed butterfly needs scrubby sallow and will flourish where farming relaxes its iron grip. So why do you think monitoring is important in rewilding? Well, it's important to know what you own, what you've actually got. And with rewilding, it's such a dynamic system, there's so much change, particularly in the early years or decades, um, that there's an awful lot coming and indeed going. Um, and with rewilding, there's a little bit of pressure on us because we need to be able to demonstrate success very strongly. Um, so these incoming new, you know, iconic species, uh, and you get what you're given. You know, there's no plan. <laughs> you just accept and 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 enjoy what you're given. That's really important. Um, so so there we go. So can you give me some highlights from your survey work you've been doing here? Yeah, there's a distinction between survey and monitoring and an annoying grey area of overlap, <laughs> sort of repeat survey. Um, but yeah, what I particularly do is monitor purple emperor populations. Now that's not easy um, and the standard method for monitoring butterfly populations doesn't work with purple emperors because they're high flying canopy dwelling, low population uh, butterflies. So we've had to uh, dramatically adapt the standard butterfly transect method, which we've done. And we've got a purple emperor, a single species transect, which is two kilometers long. We're actually halfway uh, along it at the moment. We walk in afternoons in reasonable weather, only during the purple emperor season. And we only count emperors and we ignore everything else. And our, our recording box is 50 meters because you can record purple emperors. You can positively identify them easily within that range. And we've been doing it since 2014, I think. And it's terrific. Uh, it's really giving results. Serving with the least disturbance seems to fit in most with the needs of wildlife. So I decided to use my camera traps to watch the unseen. There aren't apex predators at Nep Wildland, like the reintroduced wolves at Yellowstone National Park in North America, but the fear factor was evident in cautious movement. And right amongst the undergrowth, caught in action, 
A stag's antlers proved perfect tools to bring food to the table. The trap cams captured footage of other wild creatures. Like storks, foxes, rabbits, and fawns. But the world of moles was closed. Tunnelling away in their mostly solitary underground world, they are hard to spot, and these fossorial mammals were not part of NEP's original baseline survey. So I set out in daylight to find out more about these super diggers. As Rob Atkinson's book on moles will tell you, if you see images like these, you can be pretty certain that they are dead moles posed for the camera. So meet Talpa, my surrogate European mole, who will demonstrate just a few of her many adaptive features for an underground life. Her eyes are poorly developed and hearing is limited, but on her nose she has amongst the most touch sensitive organs of any mammal. These are called Imus organs, and they help her to explore her tunnel system and find her major prey earthworms. The dead giveaway to her lifestyle, however, is her strong, spade-like clawed paws. And if you could look inside her body, you would see an amazingly strong, superbly adapted upper skeleton, with huge muscles attaching each shoulder blade and humerus to a breastbone, producing massive power for her little size. In fact, she is so strong that she can exert a sideways pushing effort of 24 times her own body weight. Altogether, it has to be said, she is a pretty cool, well-adapted, magical creature. Despite being supremely adapted to her underground existence in the natural environment, she may find herself in the wrong place at the wrong time where the land is managed. Moles have not had it easy. Skinned for fashion coats, strung up by gamekeepers, reviled by farmers when their molehills are sliced up in silage making, the invention of the lawnmower in 1890 was the final straw. Innocent tunnelling on our green ecological deserts alienates them. And yet they aerate the soil, eat unwelcome grubs and provide runoff tunnels for excess water. A true gardener's friend. Even though I was surveying in high summer, and the mole population will swell with youngsters, I still didn't expect to be fortunate enough to see a mole. And I was right. Drone surveying was problematic since the mole hills were overhung by tree branches and long grass was an issue. It was good though to capture one long run of mole hills close to a hedge line. I could also feel signs of activity with my feet, and patterns began to emerge. Some molehills and tunnels followed the edge of oak canopies, and moles typically tunnelled out from hedgerows too. With the land rested from the plough for two decades, though trampled by free-ranging hooves. Could soil compaction play a part in mould distribution? Was there more food and better safety near hedgerows? As soil health recovers and soil fauna build up too, mould density should increase. But how will we know? 
Molehills reflect many soil variables, available food, tunnel repairs and the need of mating, soil pH, wetness and texture as well as temperature and overall habitat type. A field with no apparent visual activity could still be hosting some busy moles. The gentleman in black is an enigma with research posing more questions than answers. A puzzle to unravel, a lengthy project to monitor. Moles are indicators of soil health, but so subtle. Rewilding projects need to collect data in order to unravel mysteries, persuade, assess, develop and reassure, particularly in densely populated areas where humans expect environmental control. But we need natural patience too. Long-term monitoring helps reveal new dimensions of the web of life, but at nature's pace, And rewilding is a type of nature that arrives unboxed. Steadfast surveying and monitoring will keep us in touch with its progress and help us share the outcomes. And with the natural world endlessly seeking to determine its own course, could it be that humans will then feel more confident in stepping aside and allowing it to happen? Rewilding may seem radical to some, but with its help nature could recover and a new green dawn would be an exciting destination for all of us to travel towards.
Rewilders. My, I, I can't say the word Rewilders. 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 